Well, I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming. I guess a bit of the formalities first, and also thank you to Nourish for putting on this talk and also for the musicians to set the stage. Um, I'm going to introduce myself first for those who don't know me. My name's Katie Bowman, as already said, and I usually introduce myself as a biomechanist. But I've been thinking about that a lot lately, and I would say that probably my perspective is, if I were to talk about the influence of my work, it's I'm a human, I'm a mother, I'm a citizen with many privileges, and then I'm a biomechanist. So all those things go into informing my point of view. And biome biomechanist might be the one that's the least familiar to you all. So biomechanist is a... It's a field of science that studies really the Newtonian physics, the mechanics of living systems. Specifically, movement is where I focus on, but there's biomechanics across all fields of biology. And I'm very excited to be speaking at a, at a conference that feels, I've been looking through a lot of the literature, that feels really about food systems, the impact of sustainable future. And movement doesn't usually get a large voice. We are, as I'm going to point out very shortly, this is where I give a whole presentation before my presentation. Um, we're a sedentary culture. And so I was at many bookstores because I'm traveling to speak. And if you go into a bookstore, you will see um, the nutrition and the cookbook section having rows and rows and rows and rows of books. And if you come to the movement section, you will find many bookstores don't even have one. And if they do, it's usually a very narrow case of books. And so those are the things that we're going to be talking about today, really the, the culture around movement. But I am going to be talking about the difference between exercise and movement and why it matters. And I'm doing that. I travel around and speak and write about movement so much because we are currently experiencing unprecedented sedentarism. So sedentarism is, right now, is defined as a whole person really not moving. I'd like to define it a little bit more uh, narrowly, which I will do hopefully by the end of this talk. And the reason it's such a big deal is because humans have always moved up until this recent timeline. So unprecedented lack of movement is in not only in total human movement, but in, like we would call it the volume of movement humans are doing, but the range of movements, the types of movements are getting slower or smaller over time. And so evolutionary mismatch theory is just this idea that the physiology evolved to a certain set of stresses. I think of them as inputs. It's easier for me to think of them as inputs, things we put into our body, environments we place our body in, and that there are elements in those environments that are, I think of them as really parts of an, our anatomy. They're, they're parts of things that we need. They're inputs that we need. And that when we don't have them, it results in disease. And so nutritional compounds, vitamin and minerals, these are things that we need, even though our environment necessarily no longer maybe contains foods that offer these. And so I'm going to make the same argument for movement, that we are maybe even more than food, more than any other environment, mismatched with this lack of movement environment, this unprecedented total loss of almost the entire volume of movement of humans, except for this small group right now. Not in this room, but you know, in the larger sense of a culture. So where did all the movement go? So I'll point out, too, that uh, culture is an interesting thing. And I will also say that we're going to make up time, but it's probably not going to be during my talk. <laughs> uh, uh, where has all the movement gone? And it's a question that I want you to be able to think on once you leave here. I want you to start seeing movement in a different way once you're done with this talk. But first of all, 
if you look around to all the chairs in the room, it's such a cultural thing that we have a talk and we sit in rows and we sit in chairs and you sit in chairs for hours and it's been normalized to this culture. We started at a very young age, so much that sitting on the floor or standing on the background, in the back of the room, it almost feels maybe a little bit uncomfortable to the culture of sitting. And so movement right now is counter culture. Uh, and that's why I think it's really important to define the difference between exercise and movement so that we don't confuse the two. So movement outsourcing is gonna be something that we're gonna be talking about. So right now, you can think of the chair as something you've outsourced your movement to. Now a chair has many features. If, if the back of your chair, close your eyes for a second, if the back of your chair were to disappear in a second, where would you go? So this means that the back of your chair is performing work that otherwise would be done with the parts of your body that are there to hold up your torso, if that makes sense. So that's just one easy way. Another, another example I like to use is um, the key fob. We have a rental car, right? So you get this button, and you're pushing this button. You're like, what movement is this saving me? And it's saving you you know, this motion, which it seems insignificant unless you are one of the many, many thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who've gone to physical or, or occupational therapy to restore pronation and supination, right? So they, they're just separated away. We've pulled movement out of the context by slowly shifting to practices that we view as convenient. They're usually technology, and I think of technology in a more biological sense. A backpack is technology, saves you from having to carry things in your arms. So it's not necessarily a digital technology, but a technology is the creation of something that required a, a tinkering and some sort of construction to be able to um, create. But I would point out now that because our need for a large volume of movement and quite a range of diverse movements is still required, we have not actually saved time with our conveniences. We've only saved the movement. Therefore, all the movement that is no longer found within the day is displaced into there's no more time to be able to find it because we've removed it slowly from our day to day or even more deeper than that, minute to minute. The hour to hour parts of our lives have become a less and less movement intense. So it hasn't really saved time. My work, I file it under a brand called Nutritious Movement. And most of us here understand what a mineral is, what a vitamin is, what a nutritious meal or a nutritious diet looks like. But the reason we have uh, such comfortable understanding of these terms and concepts and language is because of over 500 years of research into isolating compounds that in their absence diseases erupt. That's what deems something a mineral, uh, a nutrient, sorry. So a nutrient is in its absence, something predictable happens and when you reintroduce it, that predictable thing goes away or the symptoms of it are reduced. So we have this idea of food as medicine. But culturally, we've been brought along for hundreds of years. I learned about vitamins and minerals in elementary school, and I would wager that most people did too, this kind of sense of there was nutritious food, we, you know, we got a food pyramid, and, but we, we had this understanding of there's things in food that we need. But we don't have this yet for movement. But we do have no movement, and sort of, as if you ever go back and read the literature about how vitamins and minerals were discovered, which we're still kind of in, in midst, but early on, the idea that food wasn't just food was ridiculous. It was just, you're not starving. Why would anything be related to these small compounds that weren't immediate, it wasn't immediate. The, the symptoms took too long to erupt for them to intuitively be understood as nutritional deficiencies. And so my argument is that we are, out, we are on the beginning of understanding movement as nutrition. You know, you can, there's almost 
any health issue, if you look in the literature, is going to have like move more or exercise as a way to reduce symptoms or reduce risk. It's just not that nuanced yet, except that you will go and get small movement nutrients of certain areas to restore maybe a um, better or more diverse function, like you can lift your arm, but it hurts when you do, okay, because you're not doing it at this angle, so now do it at this angle. So if you've ever had physical therapy, you've gone through the process of learning how to raise your arm in a way that moves you differently than the way that you used to move your arm. So if, I, if you were to come to me for nutritional advice and I said, eat these vitamins and pills only outside of the context of food, with your information now, it wouldn't make sense because you really can't subsist on tablets. You also need calories and water and fiber and other nutrients that are not found in tablets. But we don't understand that about movement yet. And so we are using really the, the vitamin or nutrient approach with movement, which is to try to find a small isolated compound in a bout of time and take a dose of it to offset these things that are erupting from our sedentary culture. Where did movement go? Movement used to be found in every single activity of daily life. That's how things get done. I think of movement as really the original commodity. Before they were a commodity, you had to move in exchange for the thing. You had to create the thing. And so right now, if you're thinking movement and it's exercise and you're thinking jogging or I'm talking handcraft movements, I'm talking bending, food processing, not only getting the thing that you are processing, which is climbing and reaching and digging and things like that. So right now, we take exercises like vitamin supplements. And it, I imagine that it's the natural course of trying to figure out how to use movement um, as medicine. We've been using food as medicine, and now there's this new idea of using movement as medicine as well. But I would say that I like to reframe movement as medicine to really introduce the idea of movement as nutrition. So nutrition and medicine are two different things. Um, there's one, uh, to me, implies a fundamental need. You know, you don't need to start eating because you're ill. You've always needed to eat to make some basic needs. And movement is really the, it's the backbone of every physiological system in the body. Things that are not musculoskeletal in nature still depend on movement to fulfill their biological role. So how do we create a more nutritious movement diet, if you will, if we were to approach our movement in the same way we approach nutrition? Um, in order to do this, I think we need to visit the concept. So I put breakdown. And I mean breakdown in the sense of making sure that everyone understands the terminology, but, but also some of these might need to be broken down in terms of culturally and not use them any longer. Or, so I often will give this talk to a crowd that's doing uh, the scientific work in uh, movement science, but it's also practical in your daily life. So physical activity, it's a term that refers to any, any bodily movement produced by your skeletal system, that, re that results in energy expenditure. So it has to expend some kilocalories. You have to burn calories to be able to do it. And so the fundamental definitions in movement science almost all relate back to burning calories, which was a very early understanding of why you might need to move. You eat too much, you need to move more. And so it has real, it's kind of outdated in the sense of there are many more benefits to movement than moving to offset what you have ingested. But our fundamental definitions are still based on this concepts of um, calories and metabolic effects of movement. Um, and that's why I think we're not quickly making the jump to understanding our need for movement a little bit more. And has to relate to physical fitness. So if it's not about the metabolic system, spending calories, and physical fitness, then it doesn't count as physical activity. So this is what qualifies something as physical activity. And what's that? I, I will. In physical fitness, it's the ability to carry out daily tasks with vigor. So if you are physically fit, you are able to carry out your daily tasks, whatever they are, well. 
So I'm going to say vigor and alertness were to substitute well, meaning you're not maybe dragging all the time through it or find it really hard to cope with these tasks. Um, you're not overly tired. You have energy to not only do your daily tasks, which are the mandated, I think of those as the mandated daily tasks, but also the things that you want to do for leisure, you also have ability to do those as well. So it's this idea of being robust enough to do the tasks of your daily life, as well as anything that might come up outside of it. So that's a new idea of the, the term is resiliency or adaptability, the fact that you could not only meet what you do every single day, but you have enough leeway to meet something unexpected. So if you think of walking, I walk every day on the same straight walk, and I can walk 10 miles, but should you come to the cobblestones in Boston, now the walk is a little bit different, and you struggle with that, right? So we want to be able to. Uh, adapt our body to different environments that might arise, which allows us greater, greater freedom to move outside of where we move most often. So here are examples of physical activity. Diagrammed. <laughs> so, and I, and so I usually will talk, and then for those who like examples and visual, I'll follow up with those. So these are just examples of physical activity. So gardening, another a term in literature is acti activities of daily living. It's, they're the things that, um, it's anything, anything that uses your body, that burns calories. So exercise, as you're going to see here in a second, is a subset of physical activity. So that's why I put exercises in, in this example, because if you were to lift weights, that will qualify as physical activity. But we do need to talk about exercise. So exercise is a very specific <coughs> type of physical activity, bless you. It is, it usually has a mode, which means you've picked the thing that you're going to do. You plan it. It's structured in the sense of you de you've decided how long, how far, how many, what intensity. It's, very, it's much more quantitative, and it really has in your mind a start and stop point. It's a movement class. It is. Um, you're going to it. Sometimes you go to a space that's all, that is only for that type of movement. And so that's what qualifies it as exercise. It's that it's structured. And you are doing it to improve your physical fitness, meaning there's an intention behind it. You're doing it specifically to maybe eradicate the issues of that are erupting from general sedentarism, or maybe you're doing th something specific for a specific part of your body. So that's what exercise is. So here are some examples of exercises. There's nothing amazing up there. It's just a, <laughs> it's just it's just anything that you can think of. You know, if I asked you what do you do for exercise, you can bring it up and put it into that box. But I want to show you the relationship between the two. So I love a good diagram. So exercise is, a, like I said, it's a much smaller subset to physical activity. Um, and that's all I have to say about that for right now. <laughs> I'll get, I can expand on it, but I'll expand on it naturally. So to review physical, and activity, or sorry, physical activity and exercise, they both relate to KCALs or caloric expenditure. And I think this is going to be important because currently we have a hierarchy of movement, whether we know it or not. Maybe you don't hold it personally, but culturally there's a hierarchy of movement where longer, more intense counts more, and things that are for a shorter duration or a lower intensity don't count. And what's happened is, as our, as our lives, the volume of time in our lives, as our lives um, culturally are getting busier, where we have to work longer, and often um, there's a kind of a phenomenon of making less money over the same volume of time. There's less time to fit in this displaced movement. And so because we have this hierarchy of cardio, endurance, long time, high intensity on top, and we can't fulfill it, we end up doing nothing because we can't do the thing that counts because we really don't understand movement outside of exercise. So it's really important to understand that these are 
relating to metabolic issues and calories. Um, they also typically refer to whole body states. You're either exercising or not. You're doing physical activity or not, and I would counter that, and I will. Um, <laughs> They don't fully represent the phenomenon of movement, which I'll also define here in a minute. And then they also fail to integrate much more uh, recent, robust, non-fitness benefits to movement. So even though the understandings have evolved, the original terminology hasn't. And, and there's not a, because movement is on a decline. So I said we're unprecedentedly sedentary, and it's increasing. We're sitting an hour more this 10-year period compared to last year last 10-year period, and that's with much more abundant research on why we shouldn't. So there's some other phenomenon that's greater than knowing that I'm interested in. So what is movement? So movement is simply, this is like a very large view, it's simply a change in shape. It's a change in shape, these are tissues or cells, you see the individual cells. So I think of movement on a tissue level, and at the end, I hope you do too, um, at the end of this talk, maybe not the end of all. Um, so it's a simply a change in shape. So it's when the cells in your body that make you up change shape, that's movement. So it's a lot larger of a phenomenon than physical activity and exercise, at least with their current definitions. So mechanotransduction, this is the process by which a cell or a group of cells sense their displacement. They all have cytoskeletons. The cytoskeleton changes shape. That change in shape is sensed, and then those mechanical, those mechanical changes are converted into biochemical signals that goes on and adjusts the parts and functions of those cells and those tissues. So this would be like an epigenetic phenomenon, but it's also, it's also why movement and nutrition behave similarly. You put something into your mouth, it changes the biochemical signals of your cellular behavior. You put some movement into your body, you change the behavior of the cells that make up your tissues, and then, of course, the tissues themselves. So it really is a similar phenomenon, slightly different process, but because the compounds, mechanical compounds are invisible. And that's really where um, biomechanics was kind of displaced for chemistry many years ago, because when Microscopes came up, you could see, you could measure. It's a lot harder to measure invisible things like forces and movements, and so that's why it's taken a little bit longer until now technology has revealed some more things. So again, this, is, this would be the relationship between exercise, physical activity, and movement. They're, they, exercise is movement, physical activity is movement, but movement is not exercise, and movement is not physical activity, it's a much broader concept. So you have a body. Yay. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't learn that here. You have a body. And two, your body is fashioned out of a trillion smaller bodies. I promise I'm not going to go too philosophical, but that is the mechanical case. Yes, you are a whole person, but you are made up of smaller entities that aren't necessarily behaving in a unified fashion. So illness often erupts in the smaller bodies. It expresses the whole person is experiencing it. I mean, so I said not philosophical, and I've already gone there. But, <laughs> but it's important. I'm going to do this for a very specific reason, because I do not believe that whole person sedentarism is the only phenomenon. There are many people who are, by our definitions, active, maybe that one to two hours, but have sedentary areas within their body. And that's why movement needs to be defined a little bit more clearly. So this means that movement can be both a whole body phenomenon, but also a local or part by part phenomenon. Simultaneously, those things are happening. Um, so I'll give you an example of a, of a local effective movement. So this is, I always say, this is like the worst personal training program ever. You sign up for this study, and you are a not highly trained individual, and you will be given a program of one leg doing exercise and one leg not doing exercise. So that's, so it was one of the first uh, for this problem, uh, intra-individual control. 
You were both the person who was the control, you had a control leg and you had an experimental leg. And so, you're, and so each leg got a muscle biopsy, one in your quadriceps, and you did three months, four times a week, 45 minutes of, I mean, basically leg extensions. It was really maybe not that fun. Um, but anyway, it's for science. So then they redo the biopsy, and so you're exercising, you're working quite intensely as you're doing your leg extensions. Your whole person is feeling the effects of exercise, but the cells that changed in response to movement were the legs that were doing the exercise, not the other leg. So if you imagine riding a bike, is all of you riding a bike? Sure. Is all of you moving so that you can ride the bike? No. And so this, we already understand this need to distribute movement over the body. If there are any athletes or um, weekend warriors or non-athletes but just really like exercise, you might have already encountered eating one movement food a lot and being told, maybe you need to add some other things to your training. Maybe if you're a runner, maybe you need to be doing some stretching or doing some things for your upper body. Or if you're um, a cyclist, that maybe you need to be doing something for your hip bones a little bit more. So we already have this idea of cross training. Uh, but this is very important because it introduces the idea that there's a difference between systemic or whole person benefits to movement and local or geometrical changes, the parts doing the movement, which is part of a greater argument that I'm making here. So if movement is on the part by part level, if you're adapting to movement on the part by part level, sedentarism also has to be on the part by part level. So as a, I'm very interested in the phenomenon of how a sedentary culture keeps getting more sedentary. What are the thought processes, the conclusions, the questions asked by a sedentary culture? And how do we keep getting rid of movement? And there are many people who exercise regularly. And, and many times, they are the greatest volume movers in this sedentary culture. But if you, if you exercise an hour every single day, that's 4%. So it's very actually small relative to other human beings in the timeline and also alive on the planet right now. So that's where the sitting is the new smoking research kind of came up, which is people can be regular exercises, but it's not as protective as it's made out to be. It's certainly better to do that hour compared to not. But there are many people who do that and end up with ailments relating back to the movements that they're doing. And so it's easy to say, then we should get rid of that modality of movement. Right? It's easy to just start getting rid of exercises and movements because we're not maybe looking closely enough to say, well, what was the whole movement diet like. Like you can take one food and only eat that and you're going to be malnourished, even if it is the most nourishing food of all time. And it would be easy to say this food is not nourishing. <laughs> Throw the kale in the basket. You can't subsist on kale only, but it does not say anything about that individual food, it's about the diet as a whole. And so where I, when, you're, when you are in the movement community a lot, you can see movements like being thrown in the trash can because it's, as a sedentary culture, that might be how we preserve our state of sedentarism. All right, so if we are able to be active and sedentary on a part-by-part -part basis, then move more is not necessarily the most complete recommendation, it's also move more of your parts. That could be another way of looking at it. So if we go back to dietary nutrition, it'd be like, if you're malnourished, just eat more. And certainly that can help in many cases. But it's also kind of a crapshoot that what you choose to eat when you're eating more contains some of the smaller compounds that you personally needed. And so we're trying to get a greater map of what all the movements are. So again, this is, our, this is what we have here. And to revisit what movement is, movement occurs on the cellular level, but it's not limited to musculoskeletal movement, and I will have examples for you. Uh, 
It can affect the whole body level. It creates systemic responses. But it can also affect the cellular level. It can create local responses. And it does not require a particular intention. It does not require that you expend calories. It's simply a change. It's simply a change in geometry. So when, you can, when we bring these non-exercise movements in, then the potential for you to start moving more is much greater than tinkering around with trying, either trying to find time for exercising or figuring out if you're only moving 4%, what's the most optimal 4% to move in that period of time? So we've spent a lot of time tinkering with the 4%, sort of not aware that we're looking at 4%, spending a lot of money and time negotiating the 4%. So non-exercise and physical activity movement. So these would be the movement bubble that is outside of the physical activity and outside of the exercise bubble. Those are loads that are created through posture and positioning. Right? You are adapting to those all of the time. You are not, as I say, you are not adapting to what you do with the greatest of intention or the things that you like most, the period of time when you're the most mindful. You're adapting to how you're carrying your physical body all of the time, all, all of the time, because I just got from New York. Um, <laughs> body shape. So body shapes that are created as you interact with your habitat. And so movement is a response. You are sitting, you chose to sit, but we could have put 30 different shaped chair here, and each chair would move you differently. So the shape of your environment, if you look at your shoes, who has a heel on their shoe? So this is creating an environment, a low distribution. You're moving your cells in a particular way based on how you got dressed in the morning. Um, what are you resting on? When, what do you sleep on at night? Um, what do you sit on? What do you walk over? Everything here is pretty flat and level inside. Luckily, we've got in this nice rural location, you'll see that there's hills and angles. But for many people, almost 100% of their movement experience is on flat and level in a cushion, moving from one cushion to another cushion. They're missing any sort of, take your hand and press it into your arm. Right? The ability to withstand pressure that's a movement, doesn't burn any calories, but it's so necessary that there's become a whole the like, uh, therapeutic approach to getting people the pressures that they need because we don't really interact with anything that pushes on us anymore, so we have to outsource it and go find it in a different place. Uh, what about reactions to temperatures experienced? You know, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of, um, Thermal regulation, your ability to enter an environment and maintain your temperature requires movement. Look at all those hairs that you might have on your body. Each one of those has a muscle that lifts it and lowers it. So heripolation or goosebumps, those are movements that when we move from controlled environment to controlled environment or we have so much gear that we don't have to do the movement to warm us any longer because we've, our exoskeleton is so thick you lose all of that movement. Distances you can look to. So we can look out the window. There's a difference in the muscles of your eyes between focusing on me here, the distance if you measure from wherever you're sitting to wherever I am. And for those in the back, this is a pretty far distance. It's an outlying distance from where most individuals kind of in, in a traditional workspace. If you get to work outside, then you're fortunate because you have so much distance. But if you look in your home, and we have kind of an, an excessive indoor habit right now where we spend the bulk of our times inside, your eye muscles, here's my eye muscles, this is our full range of motion. So this is looking up close, and this is looking far away. But you actually have to look at something far away to get them to come down. So if your whole world is in this range of motion with your eyes, if it's from your, well, and now we're even shorter, right? We've got handhelds, we used to have laptops, uh, we used to have televisions, and we used to have forests, <laughs> and each one of those is a, different, is a different distance from your eye. So we spend a lot of our time doing bicep curls here, and we don't ever lay them all the way down because it requires you be able to see far away to get them to lay down. 
So these are non-exercise movements. They're very important to many other elements of health as it relates to movement, but not as it relates to physical fitness or fitness performance or ripped abs or whatever, like whatever, whatever uh, the phenomenon of exercise is understood to be. Which it's so much bigger than that. And here's more, as promised. So just right now, Pressure is a big one, and I've tried to come up with a better name. I wrote a paper on this, and I tried to come up with a better name, but like pressure-related deformations, like just the fact that your body changes shape when you push, when you sit on something, when you push on something. Um, another one is chewing. I'm just always trying to think of how it relates to the group. So if you're interested in food systems, the jaw used to be a tool, despite what your parents said about opening things with your teeth. Uh, the jaw used to be a tool. And so when you think about the movement that the jaw used to do, one of the strongest musculoskeletal parts, how much does it have to do right now? Me, not much, right? You can, we've outsourced chewing to machinery so that we can extract the dietary nutrients, but we're not getting any of the mechanical nutrients any longer. And like there, I uh, sit on panels for various things, and one of the most recent ones was um, one for women's, women and Alzheimer's. And there is emerging research about the fact that chewing is part of the blood distribution to your brain mechanism. So it's not fitness, no calories, but your body is so good at, you know, nature, and we'll talk about movement permaculture here in a little bit, but there's so many functions stacked into you moving. And so chewing is a big one. So if you wanted to get more movement, you could chew more things. You could, but, but sometimes our structures aren't strong enough to be able to take it because they've been not chewing the bulk of their life. So this is where things, start fitting in that look a little bit different. Breastfeeding is another one. There's no gym classes for breastfeeding that I know of. <laughs> but I would say it's a fundamental movement that requires serious investigation to long-term impacts of personal and societal well-being. But it's a movement. And it's not fitting inside movement because it doesn't fit inside physical activity or exercise right now. So it's just, a, it's just trying to become a little, grow our understanding a little bit larger. So there's a need for clarifying movement for the scientific side. We want to know how movement works, so therefore we have to make sure that we're holding a broad enough definition. Um, the way people are measured on if they're fit or not, it doesn't really always include the non-exercise adaptations, it's mostly still limited to those, you know, your VO2 max and your one rep max and um, your flexibility. What are the non-fitness benefits to movement? Um, and then if we go back to evolutionary mismatch theory, what is the mismatch exactly? Right? What, what are the, eventually it will be, what are the nutritional compounds to be found in movement? So in, in terms of practical or everyday practice for all of us, is move more adequate? Do you already know about it yourself? Is move more adequate? Have you tried to move more, but you're thwarted by something hurting when you move more or something acting up? Then you might need a more refined movement program besides move more. It's like I try to move more, but I can't bear weight on my foot. Great, let's figure out where where, why you can't bear weight on your foot came along so we can make sure that we get that movement exercise supplement right. So do we need an exercise prescription or do we need physical activity prescriptions or do we need movement prescriptions or all three? Um, and this is another example. So the Hadza, they're a hunter-gatherer tribe in Tanzania. They subsist about 90% of forage diet. So they are certainly not living relics, but they are modern people who, if we were trying to figure out, well, what is, what is, if we're a sedentary culture, what does an active culture look like? This would be a good model. And they're often um, observed for their behavior. And in this particular study, they uh, wore heart rate monitors. Because again, in the field, you're looking for easy 
measures. So to measure someone on a heart rate is pretty easy. Um, and there is this understanding that we need to be focusing on higher intensity movement in order to reap specific, I would say, the cardiovascular benefits. The HUDs are, they have very low disease markers across the board, but as far as cardiovascular markers go, they're very low, meaning they're very cardio, they're robust in that system. Heart disease is not um, like it is here. So they're to they, wore, they wore heart rate monitors for four two-week periods throughout different seasons because you behave differently based on the time of year. So it was um, fairly robust. And on average, the, this is a total activity, the third bullet down, over 200 minutes a day of light activity. So these are not things that really elevate your heart rate. And then 115 in moderate, and then 20 minutes in vigorous. So very small in that vigorous period of time. So the conclusion is, that high levels of MVPA, so that's moderate to vigorous exercise, is why they're so physically robust. That was the conclusion, the takeaway. But one of the things that the authors of that particular paper noted was the bulk of the high intensity movements, we'll call it a mode. It wasn't a mode for them, it was activities of daily living. But we would call it a mode, right? Because if you're like, great, I need this many minutes of high intensity or moderate to high intensity, so I'm gonna go get that. I know how to do the machine that gets me to that heart rate or do the thing that gets me to that heart rate. You end up shooting for the heart rate because we're told that it's the heart rate that's the valuable piece. That's the understood extrapolation. But what was noted in the paper is that the elevated heart rates typically came from carrying wood children in water. So if we go back to our understanding of the geometry of things, and you think of caring and how much more diverse the loads are, how many more different shapes you get as you, if you've ever struggled carrying a large load over a longer distance, you'll find that if you don't have a technology with wheels on it, that you end up using more of your body naturally to continue to carry the load. So you assume many shapes, I think in terms of geometry. Um, and so you end up using many different muscles for that same bout versus trying to duplicate the heart rate only maybe by doing one food, one movement food, and just doing it for a long period of time. So you, you've gotten one element of it, but you're missing many of the other elements, which is an issue with supplements. You can take vitamin C tablet, but it is not the same as eating an apple. Even though the volume of vitamin C might be the same, there's a whole different phenomenon in the apple. There's fiber and calories and water and, and, and chewing and all these other things. So while they are equal on some levels, they're not equal on other levels. And so as far as movement mismatch goes, we're used to thinking of the systemic effects. So we're like, how many minutes did they move? Great, I'll replicate the minutes. How many calories did they burn through the movements? Great, I'll shoot for that. Or what was the intensity? And we'll shoot for that. But if you dial it in a little bit more, you're gonna start looking at things like geometrical variance. What part of their body did they use and, and how? What were the types or, well, I'll call it mode, but mode is not really maybe the appropriate word in the case of the Hadza, but it, like, what, what were they doing? that made that particular movement. Because as we're starting, and the why it matters, because I said I would cover that, is as we try to go from a sedentary to a non-sedentary culture, we're going to have to reverse engineer where movement used to go. Because we've created a whole system or framework that is movement-less. So much that it's counterculture to start adding it back in. So I do, that's probably the greatest volume of my work is to try to figure and model. How does it fit in? Where are we gonna put it? How do we make it accessible? How do we make it adaptable? Those types of things. Um, so when it came to the Hadza, just as an example, there was total movements moved 356 minutes a day. That's a lot. That's different than 4%. That's different than 60 minutes a day, which we feel great doing, but as you do more, you'll feel the contrast, right? So you, to feel the contrast as you become 
a more robust mover, and it doesn't have to be robust in terms of difficulty, we can always work within our ability, but it really is in terms of frequency and volume, adding more movement. I mean, even just right now to shift your position, to not use the back of your chair, to shift away, to um, feel comfortable standing up, and, and everyone's free to stand up and walk around anytime during any of my talks. Um, we're, used to, we're used to thinking about, again, matching those intensities, but we can play with other, other ways that don't fit necessarily within the culture of exercise. We can still take those understandings. They apply, but the modes are different. It doesn't have to be isolated. Exercise is often isolated from getting done any other task in your life because we've made all the tasks movement free. So therefore, we've had to create a new compartment of here's where you move. Nothing else is going on but the movement, and we just tend to do that as a, as a, as a culture that, that uses the calendar and the clock in the way that we do. It's kind of segmented, and, and um, the way we think of time is, I think, affected a lot of this. So we've gone through the local and the systemic of an individual. There's also the ecological perspective, and that is the level that I choose to work on what is the purpose of movement? What are the initiators of movement? How does movement, a, a lot of it, fit into life? Because I think that we have to, like so many problems, take an ecological perspective in order to get it right. Because it doesn't, what makes sense on the individual level when you scale out to the ecological level sometimes doesn't make sense. So I like to hold all three simultaneously to make sure we're getting the individual part, the whole, as well as considering ourselves to be individual parts of a greater whole. How does movement outsourcing affect other communities elsewhere, things that you don't see? They're, they're, all, they're all related, um, and I like to look at the intersection of many issues through a movement lens. Um, I put thank you here, but that's premature. Thank you, and also I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I forgot to say, I have two little kids. I'm tired most of the time. Uh, so, and I also just like random gratitude as well. <laughs> so as I said before, so we're, we are used to manifesting. We are used to having to manifest the practice of movement through an understanding of consequence if we don't, which is also a new or unique phenomenon. Right? We're rationalizing the fact that we need to, to move um, when we exercise. But the rest of the time, you're just responding. So I have everyone just consider paying attention to how you might have set up your life for less movement. And there are things that have been handed down from generation to generation for less movement. But you'll see them differently now. So one thing you can do, and you can write this down in your notes, go home and do a chair to butt ratio calculation. How many seats are in your home and how many seats are in your home? And you will see the environmental cueing that you're set up. I have younger children. If you have younger children and you're thinking about um, as children's movement goes even down with the introduction of uh, new unique environments to humans, you want to look at other things that are maybe easy for you to shift around. Like how, how much does your home say sit down? Does your home provide any space for anything else but sitting down? So then these are, again, like accessibility is important to me. So things where um, you don't have to buy new things, go new places, spend more money, just shifting things within your home. So just so if, you're if you are evaluating your habitat, it's the shapes of what you're taking rest on. So that would be also looking at the shapes of your chairs or your seats that you frequent most? Can you change it for something a little bit lower? Can you not use it at all? What about um, the shapes of what you walk or move over? If you are out walking around, as you walk around, do you always take the smooth path? Can you take the more wobbly path? If it's an ability-related issue, are there some movements that you could do in a safe exercise supplement environment that would make the more wobbly bits accessible to you. That's um, helping, helping figure out how to transition to that uh, adaptability, that um, resiliency when it comes to movement. That's a great way to use exercise. Temperature, what's your thermostat set at? 
Uh, how often do you go outside? Indoorness would be another one. What, what are your hours? I, there, a big piece came out on just really the how much time we are inside. And I could see in the future, I can't really see in the future, just to clarify, but I could see, <laughs> I could see that we will likely have something like indoor meters, probably digital, that um, <laughs> will measure like pedometers, like how many steps. It's like, how many minutes were you outside today? You know, something, some sort of quantitative reminder to, it's, it, we're really good at normalizing our behavior in our own minds. So it's good to have some objective, it's like, you've been outside 11 minutes today. You know, you've walked, you know, like you can start seeing the contrast, it helps. How far can you see? Do you have access to windows? Do you pause? Do you pick um, all up close activities? Do you take eye breaks? You can get yourself to a window or some place where you can move your eyes. So these are all the things to evaluate. And then also habitat, like things that we're often moving in response to are the same things humans have always moved in response to. Food, protection, shelter, family, community. These are things that we move in relation to, ship with. But a sedentary culture has found sedentary ways to get almost all the things. You can swipe for anything now. You can swipe for mates. You can swipe for food. You can swipe to find your shelter. So we've replaced all of the movement that those things used to require. We've made them faster, maybe, but we've also made them movement less. And so it's a, it's a phenomenon that when you start paying attention to it, you'll see that collectively we're making these choices. And I think it's maybe just no one's waved a flag for movement before, so that's all I'm just doing is, you know, there's a, there's a um, physical tax that comes in the terms of movement that comes with choosing to use things that I'll say saves us time with air quotes around it for reasons already mentioned. As far as exercise, you can use exercise as a therapy to work towards those larger feats. And it's not really about getting rid of exercise. I mean, our, our culture is so sedentary. I think of exercise as a really nice way if you already have that time set out. But exercise is not really an accessible phenomenon. Um, there's a lot of research on the people that exercise is a very narrow population who has the ability, the extra time, the extra money, the extra childcare to be able to exercise. So it is not a very accessible phenomenon to pursue um, as a strategy. So how, how do we add more movement and also specifically more distributed whole body movement throughout the day? If there is something that's not moving well in your body, exercise is um, a good way to think of it as a transition, a tool for transition so that you can take some movement besides that period of movement. And I kind of liken it to there's, there is another phenomenon that's going on where people are becoming nutrient centric. They don't really understand. They, they, they uh, identify more with the nutrient than with the food that contains the nutrient. They, they identify more strongly because it's how, it's how arguments are made for why you need to eat better. You need to eat these vitamins. So people are more aware that they're ill when they don't have the vitamin or the mineral, the compound, the isolated compound than they are with the phenomenon of eating. And that's where we are with movement. And so it's to, to not overly identify or to maybe decentralize this idea that exercise is the only way to getting more movement. Because again, it's, very, it's a very narrow, small portion of the day. So if we need such a large volume and distribution, the only place, unless you have unlimited uh, time and money and very few responsibilities, there's no place to get a volume of exercise that's gonna allow you to do anything else in your life but exercise. So this is a way of trying to say, let's, let's centralize physical activity and movement and then use exercise as a tool to make it more accessible. So here's where I talk about movement perm permaculture. This is, this is my, this would be like my circle set. Everyone has their own. I imagine for many, Work is a large volume of it. Am I right or am I right? Um, so you've got work, family, and just those hours make me sad. So eight hours, two hours of family. I was like, okay, this is when I when.
people think about their schedule or their day. You know, you're, you're, you're allotting time periods to things you have to check off during the day, make sure you do. And I'm, I'm not sure if this is a phenomenon. That's only something I experience, but more, some people have identified it with as well. But it's this idea of like you have a list of things that need to get done. They are in categories of your life. And because we set up our calendars the way we do, and there's only so many hours in the day, I tend to, you, they tend to occur in isolated periods of time. You exercise, then you do your family time. Oh, now it's time to sit down and do our education time, or I need to learn something. Oh, I got to make sure I'm tuning in with my community, and then make sure I have some fun. And they're all separate. But, and they're all movement void. A sedentary culture means, and all of them are movement void, for the most part, except for exercise, which is the, which is the stand-in for the movement. So it, it was something that I experienced a shift to, having always been an avid exerciser um, you know, and an athlete, not always, but as an adult. When I had kids, I noticed that the abundance of movements that I had just kind of withered up and died. So I was like, OK, I know I need a lot of movement. So I started stacking it. So it's the same. Movement has not really been brought into permaculture models. Because again, it maybe wouldn't occur to a sedentary culture that it should be there. But so many things that were brought in, even in terms of farming system, as agricultural systems, were about saving movement, making sure things were even, to reduce bending. You know, like we're, we're trying to reduce movement all of the time to make it easier, except you still need the movement. We've been able to figure how to get, we've been able to figure out how to get movement out of participating in this society. We have not figured out how to get rid of the need of it for our bodies. So that's the juxtaposition. We don't require it to participate in mass, but we still need it. And so everyone's sort of struggling to figure out how it goes in. So it's this idea of stacking it. Can you pick, for me, for example, it would be, um, I'd walk with my kids to the grocery store. Takes a long time. I could have driven there, got what I needed, and came back. But I also needed time to be with them and time to teach them stuff. And I was like, well, how about I just walk to the grocery store, and now I can put two hours and get multiple things done. And walking to the store is not necessarily a radical thing. It would be more radical to not walk to the store. But the context of our culture makes it more radical, right? It's, it's a rel like radical is relative. That's, that's a meme. I just made it right now. So um, it's this idea of you know, household tasks. If you have, when, if, wherever your dishwasher or your dish rack is, go home and look at that and see if you've arranged your kitchen so that the shortest distance to where you can put your dishes away from your dish rack has been selected. And the thing that you use the least often, the holiday platter, <laughs> requires you know, a squat, bend, roll, belly crawl, like to get it out the back. <laughs> so consider, consider changing that around. So for me, in my kitchen, I've put the things that I use most regularly down low, so I have to squat to get plates or bend to get plates. And all the coffee, it's like, you want coffee, tea, you're going to have to reach for it. It's up high. Might even have to take some. I've built, I don't have to think about it. It's not exercise any longer. It's just making breakfast, but I put movement back into breakfast. It's like sneaking vegetables into brownie batter for kids. You have to sneak it in, <laughs> to sneak it in so it gets in there. So it's just re it's like refiguring places and spaces that you're in the most often, which really do relate to food. Movement and food have always been intrinsically in entwined. And it's really the separation of movement and food that I believe we're struggling both with movement and food systems. Tried to make it where it was easier physically to get. And the trade-off in that, those, those phenomenons is, I think, what we're dealing with now. So stack it. Can you stack movement back into your life? And so here's some, just a few ideas. Rethink your furniture type and distribution. Um, rethink using it. <laughs> 
You don't have to get rid of it, but you don't always have to sit on it. You can take your hips all the way down to the floor or to an area that's accessible. Like maybe your hips and knees won't take you down that far, but maybe you have an ottoman that you can move over to where the chair was and, and drop a couple more inches down. Um, and which means you're also coming up a couple more, a couple inches higher than you normally do. Rearrange your kitchen to add bends and reaches. I just imagine like going to that spot where everything is and putting all the stuff you never use. <laughs> and then go, why do I have so much stuff I never use? Uh, reconsider your footwear. So f your feet, you know, your whole, if you, the structurally, if you think about a building or your car, the, the loads that are created by what's at the base are huge. And so culturally, we have kind of developed this preference for an elevated heel. Not only an elevated heel, but really stiff. I've been out hiking, and there's just a lot of like really stiff shoes. But you've got 33 joints in each foot. So that's quite a bit of sedentary parts in an otherwise active body, right? And it requires some. Uh, restorative movements, because if you've always worn them, then there's a lot of you that haven't, hasn't moved before. But there's a relationship between the mobility of your feet and the function of your knees and your hips and your spine. If you're coming to my Sunday class, you'll get to physically experience some of that. Uh, walk the lumps and bumps as possible. Drive less and human power yourself more. And that doesn't always mean, like for many, the places that they go regularly would be too far to walk feasibly given the schedule, P walk part way. You know, can you drive part way and walk the last 10 minutes? Um, and then, of course, that requires uh, making different decisions about where you spend your time, how early you get up, how early you go to bed, different things, making more movement accessible. Uh, take the sp stairs when or as possible. Uh, date hikes. So this social and community, really infusing those with movement. You know, do you, if you are doing dates or meeting your friends, is it someplace seated or can you be like, let's get our, you know, fill in the blank and let's go take a walk together. You know, something else where you can stack your social time with movement time. Uh, there's a lot, of, I live in a lot of agriculture and there are many um, farming activities. Like we're gonna spend this day, bring your kids, bring your friends and we're gonna weed, you know, together. But it's. You get your movement requirement, they get the labor that they need, the kids get their time, we get our friend time, but it's on this, again, the spine of movement. And move for food. Again, like I said, it's really trying to restore the relationship between movement and food, which is why it's such a, uh, an honor for me to be able to speak at a place where people are making changes in food systems. So there's simple ways, gardening more, gardening, whether it's a big garden or small containers, again, it's, Gardens are really scalable. They're scalable to mobility, ability, age, um, but they have to be started at some point. Yeah, they're just taking action. There's community gardens that can be utilized. A lot of, um, I'm very much interested in the intersection between social justice and food systems. Um, so looking at community gardens in food deserts and, or supporting people who are already have a lot of those movements underway, people like Ron Finley um, are great ways of infusing movement and nutrition into an area. Walk and carry your food home. You might have to shop more. It all depends on, every, everyone's gonna have to play with it to make it work for their nuanced situation. There's a lot of prepackaged food, even amazing healthy food. But at the same time, if we think about food as having, if we think about the mechanical nutrients food provides, as from start to finish, for many, the bulk of food-related movement has been outsourced. And now it's starting to become more peeled and chopped and <clears throat> just smaller. And it makes good food accessible to more. So that is definitely improving one issue. But from a permaculture or stacked function, if someone has the ability to do more, then you can get in the movement with your food the farther up the chain you acquire it or produce it yourself. Chewing, chewing can be an easy way, like figuring out how to chew more, snack activities. You know, I, I've kind of replaced, we do a lot of, our, a lot of our art for like kids and you know, people are in charge of spaces with children in schools. 
You know, you're trying to figure out, do we need to do art? Like, do we need to do nature? Do we need to, and we need a snack. Yes, you need to do all those things, and they can all be done through snack activities. So it's just this idea of seeing how to stack movement with food with some other non-movement food thing that we used to all get. So I'm just going to end, I promise, with, it's a quote about science from science and society. It's this idea that science is part of culture. The people doing it are participating in a culture. And the process, the scientific process, is an amazing tool. But the questions that the people are asking is influenced by their culture. So I'm very interested in how, what questions and conclusions do those in a sedent, those doing in a, in a sedentary culture, like how, how, how do we use science as a tool? And so this is just a call to recognize our sedentarism, to recognize the sedentary, the sedentary structure, and to maybe start pushing on the edges a little bit individually and then collectively as well. So think and move outside the exercise box. Final visual puzzle for those of you who like those kind of puzzles. We, if you've been struggling to get in the exercise box, it doesn't have to be the exercise box. And you don't have to ditch the exercise box, but this invitation to think and move outside of it as well. Thank you again, Nourish. <laughs>
I end up doing more non-computer things, which for me, they're almost all movement. Like I wouldn't, I don't, I don't read more. Like I tend to not read more or do other um, sitting activities. And I have, I have also not fully uh, enveloped, is that the right word? I, I have kept many analog systems for myself. And then I've gone down the road of getting rid of them and going, hey, I can't read a map anymore. <laughs> you know, and backing away and going, for this trip, we're only gonna use a map. You know, um, to, you know, or I'm not gonna look up everything that I ever wondered to find out the answer. I'm just gonna be okay not knowing <laughs> what that song was from 1972. And just really going, you don't need to know that. And I used to have a really great recall. And I have, have a very unpracticed recall. So, so it's, yes, it is moving more. But I mean, I, even, even reading a map is like long distance vision. And, and this, un, like folding a map is a huge movement skill that I've never mastered. You know? so, so yeah, like I, I see all those as moving more. But you can pull them out as different, different systems. I stopped wearing a watch because I had my phone, but then I had to look at my phone all the time, and then when I got there to see what time it was, I was like, well, let me see what else is going on in the world with my lap, my weird social media lap. Um, so yeah, I, and I've taken apps off my phone. Like I, I've, I think I've found a, a comfortable relationship with it. And then also, it was interesting spending time in, I lived in New Zealand for a little while last year, just for part work and part non-work. And in the libraries there, in the children's section, they had a please don't use your smartphone rule, and also on a park. And I thought, oh, this is very similar to um, you know, some of the reasons of having smoking and non-smoking areas. One is the effect of secondhand smoke, but two, it's the modeling. And so I'd like to actually remove the modeling from those areas. I was like, oh, this is kind of cutting edge. We haven't seen this yet, but I'm really mindful of the modeling I do with my children and, and engaging in the time that I have. And, and because so much of the work that I do is digital, just to set firm boundaries and to constantly be reestablishing them and be really objective with my own behavior. That's, that's how I've come to a movement-rich relationship with my, with my screens. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm less, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the one hour is, it's a, it's a early solution, but a lot of the, the sitting and the smoke, like sitting is a new smoking is the recognition that one of the best things you can do for your arteries would be to get up every 30 minutes. And so it's to really make sure that, um, not to negate anything, but to start expanding upon it. So when something works in a particular way, that's great, but to take that and keep making sure that we're expanding that message, and we definitely aren't hunter-gatherers, we definitely don't have that volume, but if we need cardio, and you know, we definitely need to keep our heart and lungs healthy, but we also need to keep our bones healthy, but we also need to keep our functions up. So then it starts to go, well, what do I do with my one hour? Do I ride on this bike and do my cardio? Or it, let's say that I have um, been told that I need to start carrying heavier weights because of the state of my pelvis or my hip. Now I have to choose, just like someone who's only giving them some one plate of food has to choose, like, what am I gonna eat for today? And so it's just about expanding that message to say, in that one hour of exercise, maybe you could go on a slow walk and carry something heavy to get your cardio and also these other nutrients that you need. So it's just about making to, to, to recognize that things don't necessarily need to be done in isolation. And they've changed some of the guidelines. Um, you know, the 
the governing bodies, it's um, uh, Journal of American Medical Association, is starting to say the little, the little things are adding up. So, so they're finding benefit in the small things, but done distributed throughout the day versus really looking at only doing that small compressed thing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't work in, I, I work with other people who work with mental health and for so many mental health issues, more move, more ec like regular exercise and getting um, folks moving more is always the goal. So one of the big movements again is this shift out of exercise to physical activity that is, um, nourishing other things, you know, like gardening, taking a dog for a walk, things that are layering in other things that aren't, not everyone thinks of exercising as, you know, going to a gym, to a space where there's a lot of people, but many people do, like they don't, can't think outside of it. And so with mental health practitioners that I've worked with, it's been challenging when they only have the tool of going to exercise more, but the person struggling doesn't really feel like the motivation of getting up and going to a place with a lot of people and could be maybe very stimulating is this idea of like you could take a walk and giving other other modes or modalities of movement but it's definitely something that across the board of mental health issues exercise seems to be protective protective or uh, addressing symptoms if it happens is that did you mean that or something more specific? In general, I see that we are so sedentary that so many symptoms, so many things that are arising in this particular population, we haven't even begun to understand how sedentarism are affecting systems. So um, I talked about brain health. Like we don't necessarily think of uh, dementia or Alzheimer's as, like, you, you could think of that as brain health, and I'm not really sure the delineation between mental health and brain health. There's general exercise, but the fact that, like, even impact from your foot as being part of the shunting mechanism of blood to your brain, like, what happens when you have a population that almost makes almost no contact between their feet and the ground, relatively speaking to their original environment? Like, you're, you were, I think that movement and health overall is going to be, is at the starting point like it is with nutrition and, and all the elements that arise from all the compounds that are missing. So I, I think it's a wide open field, I guess is what I'm saying. It's a wide open field to figure out what are the elements of movement, the vitamins of movement that affect mental health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's been any, has there been any research done on that? I don't know. Connection? I don't know. I can Google Scholar it later <laughs> and see. Yeah, you can see, uh, yeah, how does, um, I feel like I've read some things about insomnia and movement, but I'd have to go back and look. I'm not sure. Yes.
Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, thank you all.